Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you found my channel and I hope that you stay a while. If you're not new here, you guys are the real MVPs. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you all coming, commenting on my videos, liking them, sharing them, telling your friends about them. It means the absolute world to me and I love getting to know you all in the comments. That's probably my favorite part of the day is getting a notification that I have a comment on my YouTube video. Last week's video was a little bit heavy. I went into some super personal information and I personally related to the mafiosa that I was covering Virginia Hill. This week's mafioso is a little bit more lighthearted. It's not really a tragic story, but more of like a head scratcher slash impressive one. I'm still dealing with a rash all over my body as a reaction to my mood stabilizer. So if you see any bumps or anything on my neck or anywhere, that's why I don't think like I've been bit by a vampire or something. It's a rash. It won't go away. I'm dying, but it's okay, I'll live. I can't wait to tell you guys about this week's mobster because it's someone who is super famous, but it's also somebody whose history I actually remember. I decided to do him after I had been jonesing to do him for like a really long time, but I just kept putting him on the back burner. And then I got a YouTube comment from young Thor asking me to cover him. And I was like, you know what? The people want it, I want it, I'm doing it. It's gonna happen. I clearly remember hearing about this guy on the news all the time on the TV and his weird antics and it was always just such a head scratcher. But now that I'm all grown up, I see what an absolute friggin' genius this guy is. So let's get into it. Vincent Louis Gigante was born on March 29th, 1928 to Salvatore and Yolanda Gigante. Salvatore was a watchmaker and Yolanda was like every single other Italian female at the time. Almost everyone, not every single one, but almost every single one that wasn't a stay-at-home mom, she was a seamstress. Yolanda and Salvatore were immigrants from Naples, Italy. This is well past the time where it matters what part of Italy that you're from, but it does matter that their family is from Naples. If you hear breathing in the background, my dog is here. I keep telling him to shut up, but he's snoring, so he's very loud and I can't make him stop, so we may just have to deal with the snoring sound. Yolanda and Salvatore together had five children, all boys, which is something that would absolutely happen to me. My entire life is just covered in boys, boy dogs, boy everything. The family were devout Roman Catholics and Vincent attended Sunday Mass every single Sunday until the day that he died. He was very, very religious. The five boys' names were Mario, Pascal, Ralph, Louis, and Vincent. I don't see it listed anywhere that this house was like an absolutely horrible place to be in or to grow up in, but everything couldn't have been like all that swell because not one of those boys turned out straight. Vincent grew up with the nickname The Chin because his mom used to call him Chinzino as a nickname for Vincent. He was never really great at school, but he wasn't terrible either. He was really smart, but he just absolutely refused to apply himself, so figured solid C student. He went to PS3 in Manhattan. This public school is in Manhattan's Greenwich Village, and it's grades pre-K through grade 6. If you Google it, it'll tell you it goes up to grade 5, but as a victim of the New York school grade change, I can personally tell you it was grade six. The school grade change happened when I was in eighth grade. It was so messed up. They just, they did my class dirty. So here's what they did. When I was a kid, all the schools in New York were elementary school that was K through six. Then they had junior high that was seven through nine. And then they had high school that was 10 through 12. In 2004 or 2005, I don't know, they decided to switch things up and make it so that elementary schools went from K to five. And then they made middle schools go from grades six to eight. And then high school was grades nine and through 12. That's all fine, well, and good and all, but I just so happened to be in the transition year, which meant that I had to stay in elementary school until sixth grade, 
which is super old to be in an elementary school. But I was in grade six in elementary school. I went to junior high for grades seven and eight. And when I was in my eighth grade year, they switched it. So I was the first ninth grade class into the high school. So that means that I only got two years in junior high, which was super shitty. And it was really weird for us because we were the youngest kids in, that the high school had ever seen. We got isolated pretty badly. And it sucked because when I was in junior high, my friends and I, we rolled the school. And we got to high school and everybody got split up. A lot of people left the friend group. So it was very, very different than it was at junior high. It was just a shitty situation. Honestly, I didn't go to school for a good portion of my ninth grade year. So, I mean, other people had it a lot worse than I did, but it was still shitty. But yeah, I, I didn't experience like the worst of the worst because I just, I wasn't there. But I absolutely hated high school because I don't know if you could tell, but I am probably one of the most socially awkward human beings on the planet. I'm awkward. I'm all over the place. I can't, I have the weirdest thoughts enter my head. I was the type that like, I would have one friend and that one friend would have friends. I kind of latched on to an extrovert and that was that because I've just, I've always been very socially awkward and weird. I was always that girl that like, if there was six people there and five people fit in the car, I was the one that they were like leaving to sit in the middle of nowhere by myself for God knows how long because I just didn't fit in with anybody. I was like always the least liked person. So anyway, the thing that got me started on that is that Vincent Gigante graduated PS3 and then he went on to Textile High School, which he dropped out in grade nine. And that means that he dropped out in his first year of high school. They make it seem like he was at Textile High School for a while, but he definitely wasn't. Grade nine was the first grade in high school at that time. So he literally dropped out in his first year. High schools in Manhattan are super weird. It's not like that in the rest of New York. But in Manhattan, you have to, like, figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life in eighth grade. There's, like, fashion high school, textile high school. There's certain high schools for certain things, and that idea always freaked me out because the only thing I wanted to do for the rest of my life when I was in eighth grade was cheerlead and drink. I, I would not have made a good decision. <laughs> Growing up in New York is really strange because you have a lot of experiences that other people in the rest of the world, they can't really understand. Yesterday when I was researching Gigante, I came across a thread of some people and I can't find it. I, I found it this one time, I read it, and then it was gone into the universe. I swear, I kept looking and I could not find it again. But the guy was talking about how one day he was on vacation in New York and he was driving down by the beach and he passed by two men in suits. He was pretty much telling a story of like, oh yeah, I saw two guys in the mafia once. They were sitting on the beach in suits talking to each other. I would not want to mess with them. And I'm like, really dude? Like that's your biggest exposure to the mafia is you passed by two men in suits and you assumed they were in the mafia and that's why you don't want to mess with them? Like, what? That's the craziest example of your exposure to any kind of organized crime you can come up with? Then you have to like think to yourself like, okay, that is normal. That's how the rest of the world is. It's not normal to have so many experiences and have your life so intertwined in it. It's normal for somebody to have never come across anybody in that life or seen anybody in that life or really know anything about it aside from I'm really interested and I've read up on it a lot. Anyway, Gigante grew up in New York, and he grew up in the area that Vito Genovese ruled. And Gigante started to really like Genovese when his mother needed surgery and she couldn't afford it. I think I mentioned this in prior videos, but Italians have always been very hesitant to go outside of their own people for anything. They don't really use the police to help catching a criminal. They don't go to the bank for a loan. They like to just keep everything within the Italians and within their neighborhood. So when Yolanda, Gigante's mother, needed surgery and they couldn't afford it, they went to Genovese. Genovese loaned the family money to pay for Yolanda's surgery, and the whole family just instantly fell in love with him. So now you've got a boy who is struggling to make it through school until he drops out in the ninth grade. 
His mother is alive only because of this super powerful mafia leader who has had multiple people killed. That's common knowledge. The whole world knows about it, and they can't arrest him. Obviously, he's gonna idolize the mafia. Gigante starts to become a problem child. He gets arrested seven times in nine years between the ages of 17 and 25. These arrests are starting to show mafia-like characteristics. So it's starting to become pretty apparent that he's running with a certain type of crowd. His arrests are for reasons like receiving stolen goods, possession of an unlicensed handgun, auto theft, arson, bookmaking, and gambling. So these arrests are the kind of arrests you would expect to see from a young guy that isn't made yet, isn't officially part of the mafia, but is kind of like a soldier just waiting for his day to, you know, get made. All of these crimes, he gets either like a fine or the charges are dismissed. And that keeps happening until he gets the gambling charge. And with the gambling charge, he serves 60 days in jail. When he goes to jail to start his 60 day sentence for the gambling charge, he lists his occupation as a tailor. What he's really into though is fighting. He's been fighting in the underground circuit, and he's doing pretty well. He wins 21 out of 25 fights that he's fought, and 13 of them are from TKO. These fights aren't the same ones that you would see on TV, though. They're only four or six rounds. They make money from a percentage of the ticket sales, and they have to sell the tickets themselves. He was known in the boxing ring as The Chin. I've seen a few different reasons for his nickname I heard because of his mom's nickname. I also saw that he started getting called that because he had a glass chin. In other words, it was easy to, you know, break his chin if you hit it. I don't think so though because again, he won 21 out of 25 fights. That's a pretty sick streak. Like, you can't say anybody has a glass jaw with 21 out of 25 fights won. In total, he boxed 117 rounds. He lost the first professional fight that he ever fought against Vic Chambers, but when he fought him again three months later, he won that one. He started getting more legit in the boxing world. He fought Vic Chambers again for the third time, and when he fought that fight, it was at Madison Square Garden. If you're not a huge sports fan, Madison Square Garden is like as big time as it gets. The place is absolutely legendary. It's in the same place that the Long Island Railroad is in, so I used to pass it all the time, and you would see stars, like, hanging out outside waiting for their show to begin, because I went to Baruch, and I used to take the train every day, so you have to take the LIRR. Yeah, you run into people that are performing at Madison Square Garden all the time. Gigante's manager, Thomas Eboli, is a bigwig in the Genovese family. Thomas Eboli, also known around town as Tommy Ryan, stayed close to Gigante for the rest of his life. I really don't know why Gigante stopped fighting. He was really, really good at it. Maybe he just really didn't like to lose. Even though it was a pretty rare occurrence for him to lose, he did lose the last fight that he ever fought. That fight was against Jimmy Slade in 1947. He lost by TKO, so he got knocked out. It is a shame, though. He definitely could have made something out of himself in boxing. 13 knockouts? Like, that's a pretty dope record, if you ask me. Then again, you look at the people that were boxing their entire lives, and their brain is mush, and there's just nothing to them anymore, so he probably did the smart thing in getting out of boxing, even if it was crime that he went into. In 1950, Gigante married Olympia Grippa. Together, they had five children. They were named Andrew, Salvatore, Yolanda, after Gigante's mom, Roseanne, and Rita. Gigante owned a house in Old Tapan, New Jersey, where Grippa and their five children lived together. He also had an apartment on the Upper East Side where his mistress, Olympia Esposito, lived with their three children, Vincent, Lucia, and Carmela. Do you know how mad I would be? I'd be so mad if I find out that not only is my husband cheating on me, not only does he have a second common-law wife, not only does he have three kids by her, not only does she get to live on the Upper East Side while I am slumming it in New Jersey, but that the other woman has the same freaking name as me? No. Absolutely not. No. I mean, it's pretty smart on his part. It's never going to yell out the wrong name in bed. Even though Gigante had two whole-ass families, he was like 99% of other Italian boys. He was a mama's boy. 
and he spent most nights staying at his mom's house. I know I've spoken a lot about Vito Genovese's slimeball ways, and I'm sure I've explained this entire situation before, but let's do a brief overview of what happened here. So we're past the point of World War II, we're past the point where Luciano was deported, and we're past the Havana Conference. Genovese really, really wants some power. He's treated like shit because he's a conniving little weasel, and he doesn't really like it. Genovese goes to Carlo Gambino, and he's like, all right, bro, let me break it down for you. I want control of my family. You want control of your family. We can make this happen. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to have my back and help me take down Frank Costello, who Lucky Luciano left in place as the acting boss when he left in exile to Italy. And after that, I'll help make you boss of your family. And poor little Carlo Gambino over here is just thinking that Vito Genovese is like a halfway decent human being, so he hops on board. On May 2nd, 1957, Genovese sent Vincent the Cingigante to take out Frank Costello. As Costello was entering his apartment at the Majestic at 115 Central Park West, coming home from a dinner date with his wife, Gigante called out to him. He said, hey Frank, this one's for you. As Frank turned to see who said that, Gigante shot his 38 caliber at Costello's head. Gigante took off running as Costello fell to the ground. Since he had shot him at practically point-blank range, he had absolutely no reason to look back. He knew that he had to be dead. He had to be, right? Not right. Gigante is either an idiot for calling him, causing him to turn his head and the bullet to miss, or just a really, really, really bad shot. Frank lived when the bullet barely grazed his head. There was no solid proof that Gigante did it, but it was the prevailing theory that the police went with. Due to informers in the mafia, they were well aware that Genovese was planning to make a power play within the family in some way or another, so when they were given the description that fit Gigante, they knew it had to be him because Gigante was Genovese's protege and it makes sense that he would send him to do this. Honestly, in any other case, police definitely would not have arrested Gigante. They had absolutely no hard proof. They had no physical evidence, and they knew that the mafia boss wouldn't talk. The only problem was that after the Kefauver trials, mafia topics were front-page news at the time. Costello's attempted murder made front-page news in every magazine and newspaper in the country. The Kefauver trials were a set of Senate-run, televised committee hearings that investigated investigated every single person that was ever thought to have had anything to do with the mafia. They were really bad for any mafioso that was called because it brought them instant notoriety. Legit, so many stars were born that day. It's crazy. They got instantly famous. Americans were glued to their seat watching the entire proceeding play out from home, And even if he wasn't a celebrity by this time, anything that had the word mafia on it was exploding. Papers were writing about it a lot because it sold papers. But Frank Costello was a celebrity after the Kefauver hearings. Because he was such a star from the trials, when he was shot, everybody was interested. So because it was such big news when it happened, the police kind of were forced to arrest somebody. Even if they knew damn well nobody was going to get convicted, they had to do something, so they arrested Gigante. Costello testified that he had absolutely no idea who shot him, that he didn't get a good look at the person, and he just absolutely refused to talk. The case was dropped halfway through. It didn't even go to the point of a verdict. Gigante went up and thanked Costello after the trial, which is just such a slap in the face. Like, hey, thanks, bro. Thanks for not putting me in jail for the rest of my life after I tried to kill you. Even though Costello wasn't killed and he was alive and well and fine, it did send a message and he received it. He wanted no part of fighting for power, especially when it wasn't even power that he had vied for. He was really big into gambling in Vegas and New Orleans. He was probably one of the richest men alive at that time. He really didn't need to be having shootouts on the streets of New York. He stepped down as the boss of the family, and he handed the reins over to Vito Genovese. After the botched Frank Costello hit, Joseph Bonanno arranged a sit-down between Albert Anastasia and Frank Costello. He knew that one was needed because Anastasia was just a deadly weapon in and of himself, 
And he was leading Murder, Inc. at the time and was legit killing people for fun. Like, he had people that could do it for him, but he did it just because he enjoyed it. He liked it. Costello was one of Anastasia's closest allies. He was leading the family for Luciano, who was Anastasia's best friend and mentor. Anastasia literally owed his entire life to Luciano. Anastasia was leading his own family at the time, and he had recently ensured that all of the Italians underneath him survived the Murder, Inc. downfall that had taken out half of the Jewish Mafia at the time. He didn't want the publicity of a public Mafia war, so he agreed not to kill Genovese. But Genovese still had a promise to keep. He promised Carlo Gambino that he would help him rise to power if Gambino backed him in his power play. Five months later, on October 25th, 1957, while he sat for a cut and a shave at the Park Sheridan Hotel, Albert Anastasia was brutally killed by a group of men. Carlo Gambino took over as the leader of the family after Vito Genovese called the Appalachian meeting to order and agreed to Gambino's takeover. It was raided, and over 130 mafiosi were arrested. Again, the mafia was in the spotlight, and every single person arrested was thrust into the spotlight yet again. In 1959, Gigante was arrested and convicted of smuggling heroin with Genovese. He was sentenced to seven years, of which he served five. He shared a jail cell with Genovese, further cementing their bonds. They got really, really tight over that stint, and when Gigante got out of jail, he was immediately bumped up to Capo. He ran the Greenwich Village crew, who had their base of operations at the Triangle Civic Improvement Association. Also in 1959, Joseph Valachi was convicted of drug trafficking and sentenced to 15 years in jail. While he was in jail, he killed a fellow inmate, mistakenly thinking it was Joseph Di Palermo. He thought Di Palermo was a hitman that was sent by Genovese, but it wasn't him. He beat this dude to death with a pipe that was left in the prison by some construction workers. Even though the man that he killed wasn't actually a hitman, it was confirmed that Valachi did have a price on him. Genovese put a $100,000 price tag on Valachi's head. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murder, which led to him flipping and becoming an informant. He testified at what came to be known as the Valachi hearings, confirming for the first time in open court the existence of La Cosa Nostra, the commission, the infrastructure of the mafia, who the bosses were, which is how the families got their names. The names came from the bosses of each of the families at the time. He also confirmed what the mafia's rituals were, how their operations went, and what you had to do to obtain membership in this secret society that the world had really never heard about. Even though he ratted, Valachi still died in prison at the age of 66 on April 3rd, 1971. Okay, so this topic is completely separate from Gigante or anything to do with this video, but my mind is blown and I want to see if anybody watching has any input on this because I'm super psyched about this information. It may surprise you to hear this, but the Mafia has not been my sole and main focus for my entire life. I love reading and learning about the Mafia, but honestly, it was never really my main choice of reading material. I've always been really big into YA, dystopian stuff, like think like Hunger Games, Divergent, stuff like that. My favorite author by far is a woman named Sarah J. Moss. She wrote Throne of Glass, legit the best set of books of all time, ever written, ever. These books blow Harry Potter out the water. Like, ridiculously, ridiculously good. I have loved this woman forever. I literally make friends with people that I see reading her books because I'll just like go up to them and start talking about how amazing she is, and I've actually made a lot of friends that way. Now, if you watch The Sopranos, one of the episodes where Tony is having one of his fever dreams, I think it's like where he gets shot or something, they keep bringing up reference to the Valachi Papers, a book written based on the testimony and conversations with Joseph Valachi. That book was written by Peter Moss, who just so happens to be from the same part of Manhattan as Sarah J. Moss, and my mind is absolutely blown because I feel like this is a story made just for me. YA dystopia meets mafia stories, I want to be a part of that family with every fiber of my being. The sirens in the background will literally just not stop, so I'm gonna talk over them. Sorry if you hear some sirens, I, I don't know what's going on outside. Okay, so back to Valachi. Through his testimony, not one Mafia member was actually convicted or imprisoned. 
but it did blow the door wide open to the public on the inner workings of the mafia and the fact that the mafia existed in the first place. It also led the feds to multiple unsolved murders being solved, which is always a good thing for the family. It's always sad when there's an unsolved murder. I would know firsthand. I'll tell that story one day. My whole aim was, if I ever hit 100,000 followers, I'm going to tell the story of the murder that I have personally been a part of, and I'm going to do, like, a true crime episode and just tell the entire story, but that's if I ever hit 100,000 followers, so I don't know. We'll see. I'm willing to do the episodes. I just need people to be willing to follow me, so I don't know. But yeah, if you want to hear about the story of the cold case murder that was never solved that I was involved in, help me hit 100,000 and uh, I'll, I'll come out and tell everybody. Gigante falls off the map in 1966, and he stays off the map until 1969. Legit, nobody hears a word from him. Like, cops don't hear from him. Nobody. The police start to investigate Fat Tony Salerno after not hearing a whisper of Genovese until the old Tapan cops give them a call. In 1969, this is where shit starts to get weird and a little bit crazy literally. Gigante's arrested for conspiracy for trying to bribe the entire police force, it only contains five cops in total to be fair, but the entire police force of Old Tapan, New Jersey. I'm guessing he chose this police force because that's where his house with Olympia number one is at. He tries to pay off the police force to give him a heads up if there's any police surveillance operations on him by any law enforcement agencies. His lawyer goes to court in 1969 when people didn't really feign mental illness to go into what they thought would be a cushy mental hospital rather than go to prison. His lawyer tells the judge that his client is mentally unwell and is currently in a mental hospital. He's diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and his family and the lawyers tell the world that Gigante's IQ is between 69 and 72, so he's unable to conspire to do anything. The charges were dropped on this set of charges after psychiatrists found him mentally unfit to stand trial. After these charges are dropped, it triggers a light bulb in Gigante's head. This was the easiest scheme there ever was. Prove to outsiders that you're a mental case and everybody will dismiss you. Gigante really went the extra mile with this one. He had himself admitted into mental hospitals regularly to treat this paranoid schizophrenia. He starts walking around the neighborhood in pajamas and a bathrobe. Every day, he could be seen walking around where his social club is, muttering to himself. He begins speaking to parking meters, he pees openly in public, he has outbursts at passersby, he'll swat at the air around him, and he just talks loudly to himself. He's just doing everything he can to show he's crazy. On February 14th, 1969, Vito Genovese died of a heart attack. See, this is really unfortunate to me. It blows my mind how nobody ever took this man out. He was able to live until he was like an old grandpa, and he died of natural causes. Piece of dog shit. (laughs) P.S. He died on Valentine's Day in 1969. 1969, get it? I guess he wasn't gonna 69 with anybody. On the day filled with love, roses, candies, and hearts, his heart exploded. Good riddance. Philip Benny Squint Lombardo stepped up as the boss of the family. At this point, Gigante is one of the most powerful captains in the Mafia. He was involved with labor racketeering, loan sharking, extortion, bookmaking, all the fun stuff that you hear the Mafia being involved in. Nobody in the entire underworld is allowed to say his name. When people talk about him, they'll tap their chin or point to their chin. If he ever found out that people spoke his name, he would legit have them killed. Like, this man was not playing. He did not want to go to jail. He continues his insanity act. He continues to check himself into mental hospitals, and he is never seen in public without putting on his show of insanity. This actually really helps in a few different ways. First, checking himself into mental hospitals makes him virtually untouchable by police. Nobody can charge him if, when they finally make it to court, they just get hit with a, he's insane. Second, it actually gets the FBI off his back in the first place. His crazy antics in public make the FBI assume that Gigante is just some relic, a once-was mafia member that these super powerful mafia guys put up with because of what a big deal he used to be back in the day. The FBI just looks past him. When he's caught in photos, he's just kind of 
crossed off. He couldn't be a criminal. He's crazy. He's stupid. He's insane. This goes on for decades, and this man is virtually untouchable. His power in the underground grows and grows and grows, and his profits grow and grow and grow. While all his friends around him are getting locked up, going to jail, he's sitting pretty and he's not even being looked at by the police. Here's a quick history of the insanity defense. The insanity defense as a legal concept was born in England in 1843. A man named Daniel McNaughton attempted to assassinate the British Prime Minister, who he believed was conspiring against him. Due to his psychosis, the court acquitted him and thus established the McNaughton Rule. It requires that a defendant is to be found not guilty of an offense if, at the time that it occurred, his mental disorder was so grave as to, one, interfere with his ability to know or understand the nature or quality of his criminal behavior, and two, to have compromised the defendant's ability to know or understand the legal or moral wrongfulness of his behavior. Soon after the case of Charles Gateau in 1881, where he was found guilty of murdering President James Garfield, despite his claim to be an agent of God and his defense team's argument that he was mentally unsound, believing that he was responding to a deific decree and following God's commands, when he did it. The deific degree doctrine was established. This is another step in determining the mental capability of a defendant, and it aims to measure somebody's delusional belief about a divine command and the defendant's comprehension of moral wrongfulness. Again, it's just another layer of the insanity defense. Believing one has received a deific command can obscure an understanding of moral righteousness as God is considered the ultimate arbiter of moral conduct beyond man-made laws. Researchers have conducted studies on the public's opinion of the insanity defense, and most of the public is against it. They believe that it's a ruse for criminals to get out of punishment for crimes that they committed. This has a lot to do with defendants like Gigante and David Berkowitz, who claimed that he killed people to please a demon that gave him messages that people had to die through his neighbor's dog. He later recanted saying it was a sham excuse. Everybody knew it was a sham excuse. It was dumb. Nobody believed it. Out of all the cases where the insanity plea is presented, 75% are rejected by the trier. The decision whether or not to allow the insanity defense is a pretty complex one, and when the deific claim is made, it becomes even more complex. These claims go all the way back to the Code of Hammurabi. Legal definitions of insanity or mental disorders are varied and include the M. Naughton Rule, the Durham Rule, the 1853 British Royal Commission on Capital Punishment Report, the ALI Rule, the American American Legal Institute model penal code rule, and other provisions often relating to a lack of mens rea, which is a guilty mind. In the criminal laws of Australia and Canada, the statutory legislation enshrines the M. Norton rules with the terms defense of mental disorder, defense of mental illness, or not criminally responsible by reason of mental disorder employed. So that's the history of the insanity plea. And the insanity plea is why Gigante makes all these decisions, because with him, he's being found not capable to stand trial. So he's not even getting to the point of being found not guilty. He's just not competent to stand trial, so they just don't try him. I told you in the John Gotti video that there was this really interesting war that happened between the Westies and the Italians, but I didn't go into it in that video because it really had nothing to do with Gotti. Well, let's get into it here because the back and forth on this one is pretty interesting to me. The Westies went to war with the Italians around the 1970s because the Genovese family wanted to take over control of the Javits Center that was soon to be built in Hell's Kitchen. Mickey Spillane was the leader of the Irish Mafia, the Irish Mafia, the Westies, interchangeable, and he refused to allow any involvement whatsoever by any Italians. Even though the Italians had a lot more people than the Irish, the Irish were successful in keeping the Italians away from the Javits Center. The Irish were in the midst of a war that had broken out because Spillane had James Coonan's father pistol whipped and kidnapped. 
Kunin had fired a machine gun at Spillane and his friends from the top of a nearby building. It didn't injure anybody, but it got the message across that he was no joke, and he was somebody that should be taken seriously. Spillane went to Kunin's father, he slapped him around, and he told him to get his kid in order. Kunin went to jail for murder and kidnapping, which was pled down to a Class C manslaughter charge, and he was out of jail by 1971. He did no time for that. And when he got out, he was still bent on continuing to wage war against Spillane. Roy DeMeo, an infamous Gambino soldier who is, for lack of a better word, a serial killer, came into contact with Kunin when Kunin killed and dismembered Ruby Stein, a loan shark in Hell's Kitchen. Between the Italians and Kunin, Spillane knew there's no safe place in this neighborhood left for him and his family. He moved to Woodside, Queens to live in a safer neighborhood. Once he moved out of Hell's Kitchen, his control over the neighborhood quickly started to slip. You kind of have to live in the neighborhood you're running. It's it's kind of it's kind of a rule. By the time construction actually began at the Javits Center, Spillane was still viewed as the boss of the Irish Mafia. Anthony Salerno, a high-ranking Genovese family member, wanted control of the Javits Center for himself. He reached an agreement with Kunin that if he helped get rid of Spillane, Kunin would become boss and Salerno would take over construction of the site at the Javits Center and he would give Kunin a cut. Salerno reached out to the Buffalo family to hire Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan to assassinate Tom Devaney, Eddie the Butcher Kaminsky, and Tom the Greek Kapatos, three of Spillane's top lieutenants. Kaminsky had apparently switched sides to the Kunin camp after they both killed and dismembered Patrick Patty Dugan for killing Kaminsky's best friend, but Salerno and Sullivan weren't aware of the switch. Devaney and Kaminsky were killed in late 1976, and Kapatos was killed in January of 1977. Spillane had already stepped down and let Kunin take control of the Irish Mafia, but the family still felt that Spillane had to go. Spillane was killed by Roy DeMeo in 1977. DeMeo killed Spillane as a favor to Kunin, so his control could be cemented and not doubted by anybody. Mickey Featherstone was accused of the murder and he was arrested, but he was found not guilty at trial. The relationship between the Irish and the Italian Mafia is tightened at this point. The Westies and the Gambinos, who were run by Paul Castellano at the time, with DeMeo as the point of contact, became a lot closer. Although the group was in and out of jail for most of the 80s, the Westies maintained a strong relationship with the Gambinos. The Westies kind of stepped in and became the new Murder Inc., the contract killing squad that the Italians would call when they couldn't be linked to a killing by either the government or other Mafia members. Featherstone was convicted of murder in 1986, and he decided to flip because he believed that the Westies had framed him for this murder. He and his wife Sissy began recording interactions between the rest of the Westies. The prosecutor that had initially tried his case, that an investigation had proved after the verdict that he was innocent and his verdict was overturned. When a RICO case was brought against Kunin and several other Westies on charges of murder and a whole slew of other crimes, Featherstone testified for four weeks. Four weeks is a long time to testify. Kunin was sentenced to 60 years in prison and multiple other members received long sentences as well based on Featherstone's testimony. In the early 1980s, Philip Lombardo peacefully stepped down as the boss of the family when he started to get sick. Lombardo put his full support behind Gigante becoming the next boss of the family, and he was soon voted in to do just that. A lot of the time, what the Mafia will do is create positions for the police. The Buffalo family was known to create more than one capo at a time, even if that person may not be ready for the position. It just takes heat off the other person that is actually needed in that role. In other words, if there's only one capo on the street at a time, it would be easy for a rat wearing a wire to implicate that one person. If they were to ask, who should I talk to about that? On a wire, it's easier if there's two capos and you could say, talk to whoever, and it just implicates people a lot less. That's what they did here in this case. They put Anthony Fat Tony Salerno in place as the figurehead boss of the family. This ended up fooling law enforcement and kept Gigante safe and his cover of insanity intact. 
Gigante continued to build his empire. He built a network of bookmaking and loan sharking rings. He extorted garbage, shipping, trucking, construction companies, and created peaceful relationships and beneficial contracts between them and labor unions, carpenter unions, and teamsters unions, as well as other companies within their own industries. He collected protection payoffs from merchants at the Fulton Fish Market. He had copious amounts of gambling games going on at all times, and he had a part of the Feast of San Gennaro in Little Italy, and somehow he ended up walking away with thousands of dollars in donations that people had made to a neighborhood church. I don't really know the specifics of that, but I know there was some kind of crackdown in 1995 that stopped that from happening. The commission was a pretty tight-knit group. They all got along really well, and there really wasn't any outliers. When the Mafia Commission trials started, it took a huge toll. I went over what led up to the Mafia Commission trials in great detail in my John Gotti video, so if you're interested in learning more on that, definitely go over and watch that video, because I go a lot more into it there, but I'll tell a quick summary here. Anthony Ruggiero, one of Gotti's childhood best friends, has a brother named Salvatore Ruggiero. Salvatore Ruggiero was flying a plane with his wife that crashed at Tybee Beach, Georgia. It was carrying a shit ton of drugs on it, and since his ties with his brother were really public, it sparked an investigation into Ruggiero. Ruggiero was well known to be a blabbermouth. When the investigation started, the FBI knew they hit a jackpot the second they got a bug into Ruggiero's house. They were able to place a bug in Ruggiero's Ruggiero's home in Cedarhurst, New York, and through his incessant talking, they were able to identify Paul Castellano as the current boss of the Gambino family. The feds were finally confident that they had more than enough pieces to put together a trial to go after the bosses of each of the five families. After more than 200 agents put more than 170 wiretaps through five years of investigation, the stage was finally set for the Mafia Commission trial to go after each of the bosses for extortion, labor racketeering, narcotics, gambling, and murder. Trial began September 8, 1986, against Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, 75, boss of the Genovese family, Carmine Jr. Persico, 53, boss of the Colombo family, Anthony Tony Ducks Corallo, 73, boss of the Lucchese family, Gennaro Langella, or Jerry Lang, 47, underboss of the Colombo family, Salvatore Tom Mix Santoro, 72, underboss of the Lucchese family, Christopher Chrissy Tick Fernari Sr., 62, consigliere of the Lucchese family. Ralph Little Ralphie Scarpo, 57, a soldier in the Colombo family and a former union leader. And Anthony Bruno and Delicato, 38, a soldier in the Bonanno family. Paul Big Paul Castellano put out an order in the mid-1980s that nobody in the family was allowed to deal drugs under any circumstances. Gotti's crew completely ignored this order, and Ruggiero was arrested with Gene Gotti for dealing heroin. Castellano got pissed and demanded to be given the tapes, which Ruggiero would have access to as soon as his trial started. He was soon arrested in 1985 for the Mafia Commission trials. He knew that these trials were a result of Ruggiero's big mouth, and he was pissed. He had plans to take Ruggiero out and break up the entire crew that Gotti was a part of, the Bergen crew, whose hangout was at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. With this knowledge, and after Castellano didn't attend the funeral for his underboss, Aniello Della Croce, Gotti killed Paul Castellano and his underboss, Thomas Bellodi, on December 16th, 1985. He used a crew that consisted of a lot of members, but it was orchestrated by himself, Sammy the Bull Gravano, Frank DiCicco, and Ruggiero. While he had garnered support for the move from each of the families, one of the cardinal rules in the Mafia is do not kill a boss. It is absolutely forbidden. He hadn't ever gotten the official nod from the commission to carry out this hit. He had also spent the entire time that he was garnering support for this hit going to each of the families except the Genovese family, knowing how close Vincent Gigante was to Paul Castellano. So, obviously, Genovese is out for blood when he hears that Castellano was killed. On April 13, 1986, Frank DiCicco was killed in a car bomb. 
He had been meeting with James Thayea, a loyalist of Castellanos. Gotti had actually had plans to join DeChico, but he canceled at the last second. The soldier that DeChico took with him looked a lot like Gotti, so when the bomb was detonated, Victor Amuso and Anthony Casso, who had planted the bomb, called and reported that DeChico and Gotti were dead. Gigante and Anthony Corallo, the boss of the Lucchese family, set up the hit to avenge Castellano and Bellotti. There's really not any word on what happens next. All you hear is that it happened. There's nothing on, like, what Gotti did back. Were Gigante and Caso pissed that they didn't actually get Gotti? Did they ever actually go after him again? Was there ever a meeting to squash the beef? I know Sammy the Bull was really close with Chico. He hasn't talked, as, as far as I know, he hasn't talked about what he did after he was killed. I heard Sammy the Bull talk about how he was there with De Chico, and he, like, talked about how he grabbed De Chico and his hand, like, went through his body. So he was there, and he describes it in, like, great detail. But I don't know if he ever did anything about it. So I have absolutely no idea what comes next. It's just kind of, it happened, and that was that. Once the Mafia Commission trials were wrapped up, Fat Tony Salerno was sentenced to 100 years in prison. The FBI is sitting pretty now. They know that they got the bosses of each of the families and everybody's in jail. Not all of them, obviously. Castellano's dead. Gotti's the new acting boss. Everybody knows it. The FBI knows it. The cops know it. The American people know it. You go up to anybody on any street and ask them who the boss of the Gambino family is and who killed Paul Castellano they'll tell you John Gotti. But all the heads of the families, except Gotti, were in prison. They are on cloud nine. Super happy. That high was soon shot down, though, when Vincent the Fish Cafaro, a top lieutenant in the Genovese family and protege of Fat Tony Salerno, was arrested. He was arrested with 14 other mobsters on federal racketeering charges involving concrete supply companies. He was facing life in prison. In September of 1986, he hit up the government to ask if he could become an informant and a witness to reduce that sentence. Caffaro told the FBI that everybody was lying. Angelo Leonardo, underboss of the Cleveland Mafia, testified at the Mafia Commission trials and he testified that Fat Tony Salerno was his contact in the commission, and not only was he a part of the commission, but he was the boss of the Genovese family. He identified Salerno in the courtroom and proceeded to confirm that the five families exist and how the commission works. Cafaro tells them that that's all a lie. Cafaro told the FBI that that's all one big elaborate ruse, and Anthony Salerno was never actually the boss of the Genovese family. He tells them that Vincent the Chin Gigante, the insane man that was peeing in public and talking to parking meters, is actually the boss of the family. He told them that this ruse that Gigante had been perpetuating has been going on since 1969. The FBI is now smacking themselves in the face. Like, could this really be true? Could the man that they had been ignoring, crossing out of pictures, actively avoiding surveillance on, could that man really be the boss of one of New York City's families? Investigators got their answer pretty quickly when one agent followed Gigante in secret and watched him take off his robe and get into a car wearing an expensive tailored suit. His entire demeanor changed the minute he got in that car and it was like a light bulb went off for the FBI. Cafaro was let out on bail and spent the time between October 1986 and March 1987 wearing a wire. He attended family meetings, he extorted businesses, he just did everything that he usually did. But this time, he's recording it all. When Cafaro testified, he testified at multiple Mafia members' trials. He talked about the Genovese family's involvement in large-scale labor racketeering, their control over the New York District Council of Carpenters, the family's organizational structure, and their control over the New York Coliseum and the Javits Center. I swear sometimes making these videos makes me want to move to Italy because it just points out in glaring detail that there is just no real men left in America. It's ridiculous. Every single one flips the second they're caught for the crimes that they committed. Caffaro explained in court how Anthony Salerno became the figurehead boss of the Genovese family after he had a stroke, which ensured that exactly what they wanted to happen would happen. When Salerno was tried in the Mafia Commission trials and was given 100 years in prison, 
the real boss of the family, Gigante, was free and could run the family. Apparently, Salerno looked at it like he had already had a stroke, he was unhealthy, he didn't really have that much time left to live, and at least this way he could protect the Genovese family and ensure that the family had a leader on the streets by being the person that the government would take down when they were determined to take somebody down. Something must have happened to Cafaro in 1988. I'm guessing some of the Genovese guys found a way to grab him and told him that they were going to kill him and his entire family if he testified again. On February 20th, 1988, he refused to answer questions in court during a drug trial for Laborio Belomo and three other defendants, citing his fear for his immediate family. During the trial that ultimately put John Gotti away for the rest of his life, Cafaro testified against him. After that trial, Cafaro has never been heard from again, and his entire family was put into Witsuk. You know, I definitely hate when people go into Witsuk, but at the end of the day, from what I've heard about Witsek, I don't feel like they just ride off into the sunset and live happy lives. From what other mafia members and other criminals have talked about when they leave the program, the Witsek life is not an easy life by any means. The agents will like just show up at your house randomly and tell you it's time to move and you don't have the ability to be like, no, I don't feel like moving, I don't want to move. If you don't move when they tell you to move, you're out of the program. Their one and only goal is to keep you safe. You or your family's mental well-being is of absolutely no consequence to the federal government. They do not care that your kids are screaming crying because you're moving for the fifth time that year and they know that they're going to have to leave their friends at school and everybody else. It's absolutely heartbreaking to see what it can do to a family but at the end of the day, it makes me happy to hear that once you rat, at least you are an off-living, happy, fulfilled life. I'm a very, very ride or die. I will legit stay with my man through anything. There was this situation once a few years back where I was bitching and moaning on my way home at 1 o'clock in the morning that I wanted a monster because we were driving from Long Island at my parents' house to our apartment in Manhattan, and my boyfriend ran into the store to get a monster. While he was in there, the gas station started getting robbed. I came in with my taser and started zapping it at the guys. It was one of those really big tasers, so it made a really loud sound. It scared the shit out of everybody. And the thieves ran off. And I look over, and my boyfriend's standing in the corner with his baton out. You know, those things that cops use. It's, like, collapsible. I think it's a baton. Uh, it's weird. But, like, I will literally walked into an armed robbery for my man. I do not play. I could sit here and tell you stories all day about going up against grown men, against cops, against anybody and anything for my man. But one thing I can't say that I would stick around for is him flipping. If he made the decision to be in the mafia, that's something I would know. That he's either going to die in this life or he's gonna go to jail for the rest of his life. I couldn't sit by and watch him rat on everybody that he's ever loved and put them in prison for the rest of their lives because he got caught selling dope or something. I damn sure wouldn't put my kids through Witsuck. Absolutely not. Sorry, Charlie, you're on your own. Have a great time. See you never again. Goodbye. I would not ride with that. I promise. So, as much as the government wishes it did, one dude testifying that Gigante is the actual boss of the family, and there's this elaborate ruse that he's been tricking the government with since 1969, isn't enough to lock up Gigante. They're now faced with this huge task of taking this man down. It's going to be really hard because you're going to have to convince a jury that this man that is in open court talking to himself, playing with imaginary butterflies in the air, you got to convince them that he should be put in prison, not a mental hospital, for the rest of his life. You have to convince them that he's mentally sound enough to even stand trial in the first place. You've got to convince them that not only is he a criminal, which would be hard enough to prove, but that he's the head of one of New York's five families. Who's going to believe that? 
especially when he has documented proof for the last 20 years that he's out there walking the streets in his bathrobe every single day and he's getting admitted into mental hospitals regularly. The defense is going to provide that and they are going to prove that that's true. They're going to provide pictures. They're going to provide testimony from the neighbor that sees him walking around in his robe every day and says that they know that he's slow. They're going to get the merchant that has a hot dog stand on the corner to testify that he's out of his mind and he barks at him every day. It's going to be easy for the defense. How the hell do you prove that no, he's not actually crazy, It's all an act. See, this is yet another thing that I despise about the government. All they need to do is prove that he's the boss. They don't really have to prove that he's ever done anything wrong. They just need to show that he's a boss and now all of a sudden every single crime from every single person that's ever been confirmed to be part of the Genovese family is now his crime. I think that's the biggest load of fucking bullshit that the government can place blame like that. The way the government can put you in jail if your books are doctored, even if you have no idea how your genius of an accountant doctored them. Why is personal accountability something that's just thrown to the wayside when it's convenient for the government? That accountant should be the one going to jail, not the owner of the company that hired an accountant because he knew that he doesn't have a degree in accounting and has absolutely no idea how to do accounting. Why is the boss of a family responsible for every criminal under him? The RICO law makes it virtually impossible to defend against racketeering. It's like the days of the Salem witch trials. You point at somebody and accuse them of being a witch, and how are you going to defend yourself? You can't prove that you're not a witch. Same thing with RICO. It's nearly impossible to defend against, and our tyrannical government lets the government continue with these laws the same way that Mussolini let Sicilian prefects beat, rape, and kill mafiosi's family members in order to get them to confess. It's just absolute lunacy, and yeah, they get the conviction at the end of the day, But at what cost? What personal freedoms were thrown aside to get that conviction? Yeah, America, home of the free, okay. Also, the home of the most enslaved human beings on the planet. There's an entire industry of prisoners being workers for free. They make license plates and all kinds of stuff, and that's why America is so quick to put them in jail. It's it's just bullshit. It makes me so mad. There's always that one thing that happens that makes the cops go that extra mile. There's one act that makes it personal. It makes them petty, and it makes them stop at absolutely nothing to put someone in jail. For Gigante, the thing that made it personal for the investigating officer, Detective Pritchard, was when two detectives that had been surveilling the family's hangout were followed by members of the family and killed when they stopped to get some food. That made it personal. Even with the cops' motivation to stop at nothing, they don't find anything. Not a shred of evidence against Gigante. He spent his whole life threatening other people that if they mention his name aloud, he'll kill them. If they talk about him, he'll kill them. He's one of the most powerful mafia bosses out there, and people know not to cross him. When Pritchard went into the club, he saw that there was a sign above the payphone at the Triangle Club that said, this place is bug, don't say anything incriminating here. That made the officers realize that this is why they haven't been able to get any illegal activity here, or any activity of Gigante being sane at all on tape. They know that it's bugged. The police were under the assumption that the Triangle Club was the only place that Gigante hung out, but they also hadn't ever investigated him. Once they saw that sign, they knew there had to be somewhere else where he was able to speak freely. There is one missing piece. Gigante's pretty easy to follow. He follows the same routine every single day. He bumbles down the road from his mom's house to the club, and then a driver comes from his mom's apartment to get him at around 5 or 6 o'clock and he's gone until the next morning. They haven't figured out what he's doing during that time, because up until this point, they didn't care. They weren't following him, they had absolutely no interest in his activities whatsoever, but now that a rat has come along, all of a sudden, they're interested. They put a tail on him to figure out where the hell he was going, and although he was able to shake the tail for weeks, they eventually discover Esposito's house on the Upper East Side as the place that he's been going every night. 
Now that they found this location, they're able to surveil him and see that he's behaving completely regularly at home. He has meetings, he's dressed nicely, he's just behaving like a regular guy, not a demented, paranoid schizophrenic. When the FBI was feeling themselves, they thought they were hot shit, and this was going to be an easy one to close. They bring an expert to place a bug at his house. Dude was supposed to be the best of the best, and it would be impossible to find this bug. But it didn't go well, and Gigante found it pretty quickly. Now that he knows that the FBI is onto him, what does he do? He goes and checks himself into a mental hospital. Pritchard gives up. He hangs his hat. He's like, you know what? I am done. Fuck this guy. Fuck this collar. Fuck it all. I'm out. And literally just moves on from the case. He wants nothing to do with it. He's done. Two years later, an agent named O'Connell picks up the file after the Genovese family is wrapped up in a major narcotics bust. They're able to flip Bobby Ferenga, a top-ranking Genovese family associate. When he flips, he admits to killing low-level mafia members that were threatening the family in some way or another. He's able to bring the cops to the remains of multiple people, and every single one of them had been buried on Genovese property owned by Gigante. With Ferrigna having flipped, they used this to flip another family member, Peter Savino who regularly meets with Gigante. The FBI wired him up and sent him to meetings with numerous uber-powerful mafiosi. Gigante got sick and had to have open heart surgery in 1988. Now, the cops are trying to link Gigante to a conspiracy. In the 1980s, four of the five families took over maintenance contracts for the New York City's window replacement business in the city's housing projects. This project netted the families over $140 million. Savino was the Genovese representative for this business. Gigante also gets the rest of his family involved. His brother, Father Lewis, is publicly hailed for his work in spearheading a housing project which built or renovated thousands of low-income homes. His name is Father Lewis because he's literally a priest. The prosecution would later claim that this project was also a $50 million moneymaker for the Mafia. Father Lewis on many occasions has denied that the Mafia even exists at all. He claims that the Mafia is just an Italian stereotype. Savino testifies that Gigante had a leading role in the Windows project with the city, which amounts to an extortion charge because in the Fed's eyes, why wouldn't someone doing honest business on the books with a city government and paying taxes on the work that they do, the extortion. They arrest Vincent Gigante on May 30th, 1990. The police's only hope of pinning this fallacy of a charge on Gigante is Peter Savino, who is currently dying of cancer. Even with Peter Savino and Bobby Ferrigna ready to testify, the case is on hold for seven years as they battle it out over whether or not Gigante is mentally fit to stand trial. They're finally able to resurrect the case in March of 1996 when they pull the rat to end all rats, Sammy the Bull Gravano. This right here is why when I was talking about Gravano in my Gotti video, I truly believe that Sammy the Bull is a Weasley rat. If he had just taken down Gotti, well, whatever. Like, I wouldn't even care. I could forgive that. That wouldn't really make him a rat because Gotti was trying to put him away for the rest of his life, too. My issue with Gravano has always been the other people that he tattled on. Sammy the Bull can be heard on multiple podcasts talking about the good relationship that he had with Vincent Gigante. He made him feel at ease when he was nervous. He, he doesn't have one bad thing to say about him as far as I've heard. But in March of 1996, he testifies that as the underboss of the Gambino family, he's had multiple encounters with Gigante where he was perfectly lucid. He used his storytelling abilities that he's used to gain millions of YouTube followers to tell the jury and the court about what a big role Gigante has in the Genovese family. He spoke about how Gigante would joke that his eccentric behavior was a big pretense to thwart judgment. Gigante's defense brought proof that he had been hospitalized 28 times between 1969 and 1995 for hallucinations, and doctors confirmed that he had dementia rooted in organic brain damage. Another informant steps up. Alphonse Little Al Diarco, former acting boss of the Lucchese family, testifies alongside Sammy the Bulgarano. Diarco backs up Sammy's accusation that Vincent the Chengigante is, in fact, lucid and more than capable of running the Genovese family. 
After DiArco and Sammy the Bull's testimony, the judge finds Gigante fit to stand trial. Peter Savino testifies for the prosecution via CCTV from his hospital bed, which pretty much just damns Gigante. Legit, like, how do you fight somebody that's giving a deathbed confessional? Gigante had a second open heart surgery in December of 1996. On July 25, 1997, Gigante was found guilty on eight counts of racketeering and conspiracy, including conspiracy to kill John Gotti, the boss of the Gambino family who had killed Paul Castellano, because Paul Castellano was Gigante's partner in multiple lucrative business dealings. Gigante is also found guilty of being the boss of the Genovese family thanks to Sammy the Bull and Peter Savino. Peter Savino is just as slimy as Sammy the Bull. The Genovese family had been trying to kill Savino for a long time, and Gigante had been protecting Savino. The only reason Savino lived up until that point was because of Gigante, and then Savino turns around and testifies. And for what? I don't even understand why. He was dying anyway. He died shortly after the trial. Why did he testify against him? Gigante was sentenced to 15 years in prison. While in prison, Gigante's health started to decline for real, and he started talking to the nurses in a regular way. When the feds found out that he had dropped his act and was behaving in a normal manner, they decided to indict him for obstruction of justice. This isn't super pertinent to the story, but I find it really funny, so I wanted to add it in. I know this video turned out to be really long. I didn't really mean for it to be really long, but it is what it is. I <laughs> Whatever. There's a lot of information. Okay, so let's set the scene. It's the summer of 1996. A little old lady, clearly over 90 years old, is out for a little stroll on the nice summer day. She is arm in arm with an older man, probably late 50s, early 60s, who's a priest. This is legit the most innocent group of human beings on the planet, right? Well, Willie King sure thinks so. Willie King is not such a good guy. He's the scumbag type. He's the type that, like, we think is disgusting, and we're regularly talking about mass murderers. To my knowledge, Willie hasn't ever killed anybody, but he does make it a habit to regularly rob people on the street. Pretty bad at it, too. He's already been arrested 21 times. Imagine how many people he actually robbed if he's been caught 21 times. Well, on this summer day, Willie decides to run up on the little old granny and the old priest and steal the old lady's wallet out of her coat. The old priest chases him, but as Willie suspected, he can't even kind of keep up. Score one for the good guy, though. There's a cab driver at the scene that chases the dude down, and he just so happens to be an inline skater, so he could keep up. He keeps up and eventually flags down a cop. Robert McKenna, doing his job for the first time in NYPD history, chases down the thief. The day started out so well for Willie. He found a beautiful mark in an old priest walking with an even older woman, her pockets ripe for the picking. Now, Willie knows it won't be long until he's caught. It's gonna happen. He's running full speed away from McKenna, and McKenna just so happens to be somebody that runs six miles a day. I will never understand people that like to run. It, it legit will never make sense to me. Ever. How could you take the absolute worst thing that humans do and make it a fun thing for you to do? People that enjoy running give me way too much discipline vibes. They're like always the serious ones, the overachievers. They're the ones like on the team sport that are like yelling at the rest of the group after the coach already yelled at them. They're the one person that like has to put their two cents in. Like the one that's like... If you're at a school and everybody's in study hall and everybody's like talking amongst themselves and the teacher doesn't really mind, it, they're that one person that's like, oh, finals are in two weeks and you should study because you're not gonna just talk amongst yourselves when you're failing your finals. Like, shut the fuck up. We have a teacher. Nobody cares what you have to say. I can't stand those people. I can't stand them. They decide to, like, take on a leadership role in a big group because they want to impress the teacher. Like, shut up. You are the worst. That guy definitely runs for fun. So Robert McKenna, the NYPD cop that runs six miles a day every day for fun, is chasing Willie down the street, and he's gaining on him. Within four blocks, he's got him. McKenna has Willie King in the back of a cop car. The cops are all sitting around laughing and, like, joking amongst themselves. Willie has been through this almost two dozen times. He knows the drill, so he's sitting there thinking, like, what the hell is going on? Why are we not on our way to the precinct? McKenna gets in the back of the car, looks in his rear view, and says, 
You are the world's worst mugger. Do you know who you mugged? McKenna gets the satisfaction of telling Willie that he's just robbed the mother and brother of Vincent Gigante, one of the most feared men in New York City and the head of the Genovese family. Willie is a really dumb criminal. He rolls his eyes. He never once shows any sort of fear of the retaliation that Gigante could and probably would dole out. Later in the trial, his defense attorney, Stephen Warshaw, offered an apology for him. According to Warshaw, the reason that Willie chose to plead guilty was to get a chance to apologize. Warshaw was the only one who offered any sort of apology on Willie's behalf. Willie shows up to court in a shirt that says, Boss, written across the chest, and then he cried to the judge about how the sentence was too stiff for the crime. There was a delay in court when the judge had to recuse himself because of his involvement in investigation into Gigante, and it took several hours to find a judge in the building who hadn't, at some point or another, investigated Gigante. When asked if Willie would be putting in an application to be held in protective custody, his attorney said, he doesn't seem to have any fear. I searched high and low, and I could not find one shred of evidence that Willie was harmed in any way in jail. I also couldn't find any evidence whatsoever that he lived to get out of jail. Unless this man came out of jail and lived a perfect life after 22 robbery charges, I don't think his prison sentence went very well. I really don't think he left. On January 23rd, 2002, Gigante is listed on the indictment of several mobsters, including his son Andrew, on racketeering and obstruction of justice charges. Gigante is accused of continuing his role as the boss of the family from prison. The cops say that he uses Andrew, his son, to funnel messages to the rest of the family. They say that Gigante would like be on the phone with Andrew and be like muttering nonsense, but there would be messages in that nonsense that Andrew would then take to the rest of the family. Andrew was released on $2.5 million bail. The prosecutors claim that they have a significant amount of tape showing that Gigante is fully coherent, careful, and intelligent. One of the tapes that they had was a panicked call that Gigante had made to his family when the news first broke about 9-11. He called Andrew and asked him if there were any children on the planes. When he was told that there were, he said he would pray for them. The prosecution used this and claimed that if he was lucid enough to pay attention to the news, He was lucid enough to understand the charges that were being brought against him. When the cops brought this additional evidence to Gigante, he decided to plead guilty to the charges rather than fight them in court. The judge sentenced him to an additional three years in prison. Gigante had been dubbed the odd father in the press based on his erratic behavior. When he made this plea, he finally came out and admitted that he had been putting on a show for all of those years, and it was all a big act to fool prosecution and avoid jail. When he pled guilty, it was like a huge story. Oh my god, a mafia boss has never plead guilty. The horror. If you look at the plea deal though, it was actually a pretty dope deal for him. His son Andrew was sentenced to two years in prison and fined $2.5 million. He had been facing 20 years in prison if Gigante had gone to trial. The deal also stipulated that none of the parties that helped him continue his ruse, including his wife, mistress, and father Louis, would not be charged with obstruction of justice. He also only got three years for that, which is a pretty good deal. Like, everyone thought it was so crazy that he copped, but I would cop too with that. Like, come on, three years? Say less. In my sleep. On December 19, 2005, Gigante died at the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, after serving only eight years in prison at the age of 67 years old. After his death, the family continued to live the good life. The last report of the family was in 2011, where it was reported that Gigante's relatives earned almost $2 million a year as employees of companies on the New Jersey waterfront. In May of 2021, a lawsuit was filed against Father Louis Gigante, alleging that he had molested a nine-year-old boy at St. Augustine's Church in 1976 through 1977. This allegation came after New York's 2019 Child Victim Act, which granted a one-year window for child sexual abuse survivors to file suits on cases that had already exceeded the statute of limitations. It was extended for an additional year when the one-year period ended in August of 2020. 
This is only an extension for civil lawsuits, allowing victims to sue perpetrators and the institutions who enabled them for monetary reparations. Without this temporary law, the window to file a civil lawsuit begins to run out when the victim turns 18 and usually ranges from one to five years. When the temporary statute of limitations was lifted, 177 people filed lawsuits against individuals associated with the Archdiocese of New York. Anyways, that is all I have on Vincent the Chin Gigante, a legend who fooled the FBI for decades and walked away with only eight years in prison after being convicted as the head of one of New York City's five families. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!